Hey there, everybody. It's Amy Miracle from Mindful Arts Studio and the facilitator of Creative Self Care. And I just want to welcome you to our Wednesday art chat on what happens when you make bad art. <laughs> um, so when you arrive, uh, please pop into the chat, say hello. And um, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you're hoping to get out of today. And if you have specific questions, I'll be really happy to answer them. A bunch of people commented on our thread uh, <clears throat> to get the conversation started. So I'll start with some of those points, um, but I'll love to hear from you as we and get going together. So I'm just going to check for one second that we're um, all operational here on Facebook via my phone. So let me just see. Bear with me a sec. Am I here? There I am. Okay, cool. All right, so, great. So our question is, what happens when you make bad art? Hmm, okay, so complicated question a little bit, simply because um, I think it depends a little bit whether or not you think there really is such a thing as bad art. And I would say for the most part, I don't really believe in bad art. Um, I think that we all have uh, some art that's really great and really pleases us and some art that really doesn't please us so much and um, that it's all really a part of the process. But before we get too far into it, let's back it up. So I asked a bunch of you what kind of came up for you when you thought about making bad art. And um, so let me just go through a little bit. Uh, Sharon said that she worries that if she makes bad art that others won't accept her as an artist. Um, Eliza said that her mom um, does canvas painting and if she doesn't like her final project, she throws it out and it's painful for her. Um, Diane says um, that when she makes bad art, she feels worthless as if she's lost the ability which then results in her going on a hiatus for a long period of time and not creating anything. And that is such a typical cycle that I see all the time with artists. So definitely not alone in any of those responses, folks. Um, Pretty Bird says, how to separate out bad, ugly stuff that clutters up your space from the gems? How do you cre curate your collection without being judgmental or self-critical? Now I'm gonna save that in our question section. That's a great question. Um, Jesse asks, what qualifies something as bad art and who or what sets the standard, which kind of goes to my point, um, and I super agree about that. Jayanti says, um, I think we become too critical. I'm not that good at art, but after I joined this group, my writing has become spontaneous along with the art. It definitely helps me to be at peace with myself and the art journaling I make. Thanks for the amazing support. And... Um, Taylor talks about how um, in the last week when we were together, I was saying how I don't show my family of origin my art because they're just not art people and they kind of don't get it. And she really understands that. Um, and then I like her question. She asks about how can you deal with knowing you need to make some stinkers, love the term, to get better, but also knowing your family will see the bad and might judge you. I have always preferred to create in private, but I don't have that luxury anymore. So another great question that we're gonna hold off on. All right, so let's see. So what I'm wondering is, so let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, what it means about, you know, what is bad art, right? So um, I guess I would say that I think it's important if you want to use that term bad art, because I'm not sure I really believe in bad art per se. Um, hey, Leah. If you want to think about it that way. Hi, Deborah. If you want to think about that way, I would say that every artist needs to produce a ton of junk, tons and tons and tons and tons of junk. I produce junk all the time, <laughs> like all the time. Um, it really is just a part of creating that 
most of what you make is not going to be the piece that you feel super proud of and that you want to show everybody. That's just not real, <laughs> right? Real art is messy and full of mistakes and uh, practice, right? I mean, this is just kind of, you know, my page here about honor your imperfections and just some drawing practice. It really is important to make space, and especially if you're art journaling, I like to just make space for pages that are just kind of whatever, I'm just experimenting, I'm trying things out. And uh, for me, art journals are the perfect place to do that because it's a journal, it's a very private space. Now you might choose to share some of that with people, whether in person or in a group like this, and that's great because you have that choice, but what the journal provides you is this, you know, and if you work the way that I work, it provides you this judgment-free zone. Hi, Shelly. Where, you know, you really are allowed to just, you know, have places where, you know, you offload your pen, <laughs> your brush, and, you know, you make notes like I was doing, or you try an in-depth sketch, um, or, you know, maybe you're doing something much more careful and studied, but it all goes into the same place, right? I make notes about things when I take classes. Um, it is super, super important to make that space in these journals or on paper or wherever you work. Hi, Sandra. Um, because if you don't, then you get stuck into this place where you can't do anything right, therefore you're constantly failing, right? Because if the standard is that you always do things super well, perfectly, and uh, don't make mistakes, then you're basically done before you start, right? That is another trick of our, um, what I think is really just a scared uh, inner critic. Right, so the inner critic's job, in my opinion, is just to keep you safe. I don't think the inner critic is evil or bad or terrible. I don't think it's something we need to, you know, forcefully push out or eradicate. I think it's just a part of us that thinks it's doing its job keeping us safe, right? So going to that question from Taylor, about how to you know create in front of family who might have judgments right like it's just this part of you that wants to protect you from experiences like that like people who might not get your art uh who are going to see it and you know you're, you're just trying to keep things a little bit precious for a while until you build up that confidence as an artist in what you're doing I mean, that really is another piece of it right until you make a lot of art you're not going to have as much confidence about, look, this is my process, I know what my process looks like, right? And so when you're familiar with a process, you know, so for example, I've been paper cutting for a while now, and you know, I'm starting to know, or I, I, I do know now, what my process looks like when I start a new uh, type of art practice, right? So. I know what that beginning kind of mining for ideas and trying things out, I know what that looks like and I don't get scared because I know that that's supposed to be messy and jumbled and imperfect and weird and all that stuff because that's where all the good stuff is. If you skip over all of that, un what could initially feel uncomfortable but is actually wonderful and open and creative. If you skip over that open part, you're gonna skip all your best creative energy. Like, wait a minute, whoa. <laughs> if you skip that part, you're missing the boat. You're missing your best nuggets, your best creative ideas, because when you're in that messy um, beginning or middle part, you're mining for ideas, you're figuring stuff out, and that's where you're, when you're fresh, when you're new, when you're a newbie, you're gonna have all kinds of creative impulses. And when you work intuitively and mindfully, um, which is what I teach in my classes, you begin to slow down 
your body and your brain um, through tuning in through the senses, right? Mindfulness is just about being present in whatever you're doing. So, you know, with the paper cutting, for example, I am just listening to the sound of the knife, the blade as it's moving through the page, right? I'm feeling the texture of the cut paper under my fingers. I'm uh, noticing perhaps the smell of my coffee <laughs> as I'm, I'm cutting. And all those things start to quiet me down and I'm doing it with paper cutting slowly. And so all these things are quieting down my brain and my body system, right? So that I'm starting to arrive here in the moment, right? My monkey brain is starting to slow down and not be such a monkey brain, but instead to be really focused in on what I'm actually doing in the moment, which as we all know is a really precious thing. So that when you work this way, you're both using it as a way to um, bring yourself into the moment and have that quiet space that we all need for our well-being. But you're also then opening up a space so that you can hear and listen to your intuitive voice as an artist, right? So that then the imagination has space in your brain to speak to you. So that when you're sitting there um, drawing or cutting or painting or whatever, it's hard to figure out how, where to put this, <laughs> um, you know, so for instance, this is a, a shape that came out of a bunch of the exercises that I do to mine for ideas, right? This is one of the shapes in my shape vocabulary, right? It's particular, not unique, but particular to me. So, you know, I was able to, when I made a shape sort of like this for the first time, or maybe something a little bit different and it evolved into this, I was able to listen and, to my imagination that was saying, well, that looks kind of vaguely like a bird. Um, and I like the abstractness of that. And it reminds me of this. And so then that influences the way that I let the shapes appear on the page, right? But if I'm just not open, right? I'm not gonna hear that advice from my unconscious or from my imagination, and I'm gonna miss the whole thing. Can you guys see how this is this is working? I'd love to hear from you and what kind of sense that's making or if it's not. <laughs> Hi, Linda. Hi, Sharon, glad you just arrived. And oh, Diana, you're here. Glad to have y'all here. So it, it really is for me about creating space, right? Um, because if you're not listening, if you're not present while you're creating art, then you're, you are gonna be in this judgment-based place, right? But if you're creating mindfully and intuitively, it's not about good or bad product. It's about good process, which is a much more liberating place to create from and much more enjoyable place to create from. And I think if you talk to most professional artists, you'll hear that a lot of them work from that place. Now, not everybody, of course, but a lot of them work from that place because if they didn't make space for that experimentation, they would never get to new material and new ideas. You need to have that space and that creative um, kind of workshop that happens when, when you open up. So, you know, I think my invitation is to start thinking about process versus product, right? And when you start to shift that focus, it also helps your inner critic to say, ah, I can sit back and relax a little bit because this is okay. I'm not going to do anything wrong. My job, as Julia Cameron likes to, to say, your job is not to control the quality of the art you produce. Your job is to control the quantity, right? Now that doesn't mean that you on purpose produce a bunch of junk and, and don't put any heart into it. It means that you put your heart into it, but you also put your playfulness into it and your openness and your, hey, let's see what happens into it. And you don't worry so much about how it's gonna be. You just show up. Your job is to show up, right? And I think that's the beauty of what 
Julia Cameron has been teaching us for so many years. And if you're not familiar with who I'm talking about, Julia Cameron is the author of The Artist's Way and Vein of Gold and a bunch of other amazing books. But The Artist's Way is a really powerful, amazing book um, if you're looking for some guidance around some of this. So um, really creating in that mindful, present, judgment-free zone that's focused on process over product. And, you know, interestingly, what for me has really evolved my art and improved my art is working this way. <laughs> like the minute you start to let go of making something really good, that's really attractive, that's good art and makes you a real artist, you start to become a real artist because you are engaging in the process. And for me, my definition anyway, and you're going to decide what feels right to you, but for me, my definition of being a real artist is really engaging in your process. Your art process is particular to you. It's not the same as mine. It's not the same as Sharon's or Diana's or Linda or Shelley's. It's yours. And if you watch, um, there's a series of amazing artist features on that the BBC did through YouTube. Um, I think it's called What Artists Do All Day. Look that up if you feel intrigued by it because it really gives a ton of insight into what we're talking about. Um, and you get to watch artists kind of tinker and practice and you know wonder and stand back and all of this. And it's just super helpful for just literally visualizing how it works. So um, I think that's important. Um, another thing that... Uh, one of the comments really highlighted for me was do-overs, <laughs> right? So um, I think do-overs are super important. So that for me in my journal, I make, I buy good quality journals so that if I have a page where I've just, for example, tested out watercolor markers to see what they do with water and it's nothing too attractive, then I know I can paint over it with some other kind of paint color or whatever and still have a page that I can enjoy somehow um, later on. Or maybe I'm going to write on it or I'm going to cut into it or whatever, but there's space for do-overs. Now, of course, I've turned away from my notes. Um, working with mistakes. I think it was, is it Jesse? Oh, Carrie. Um, yeah, Carrie noted that uh, some of her mistakes have been her best pieces. And again, with that idea of do-overs, it's like, you know, how do you work with your mistakes in an open way, right? So that you're following that creative thread, right? And so in that open place that you're in, instead of saying like, oh, that's not right, I can't do that, and you're shutting it down, you're saying, oh, that's interesting look what just happened. You get curious, you're engaging curiosity. And curiosity, by the way, is a huge anecdote to anxiety and stress. When you're curious, you cannot be nearly as anxious, right? And so when you turn on your front brain and get curious about something, I wonder what if, that really helps you to disengage from the inner critic, open up a space where you can create. And so I think that's super, super important. Linda says, I set myself up for failure when I tried to do one of those 100 days of art. And I was so frustrated because I wanted to accomplish complicated things. Yeah, I know. It's so hard because it, and I think, Linda, I'm really glad you brought that up because it brings up a good point. I think for some people, well, there's a couple different things. I think one thing is, for some people, the 100 day or 30 day or 10 day or whatever challenge works great. And they need that kind of structure and accountability and challenge. Um, and for other people, it doesn't work. And then there's a third aspect, which is knowing how to set it up for you in a way that works for you. And I think a little bit of pre-thought and planning, um, especially knowing how things worked out for you this year, can be really helpful the next time you go to approach one of those. Now, you may sit down and decide, you know what, this is just not something that works for me. I need a different type of accountability. I like, you know, I had the right inclination about accountability, but this is not the right kind for me. And that's great. That's totally fine. In fact, I like the idea of a 100-day project, but I have never done it. I've never done a 30-day project. <laughs> like, I just kind of do a lot, but I do what feels good to me. And that so far is what has worked for me. 
So you gotta give yourself space for what works for you. Now, if you decide that these projects are for you, the challenges are for you, then you might think like something I see in what you said is, um, I wanted to accomplish complicated things. Now, did you set your sights too high? Was it unrealistic what you could do? Um, you know, do you need to think it through a little bit more and maybe break it down? Do you need to give yourself space that perhaps you work at half pace, right? Like maybe you work on one piece for two days and so you show progress um, on it you know, day one, and then you show finished product on day two kind of thing. It keeps rolling throughout the 100 days. You can uh, make the project the way that would work for you, right? So I'm curious other thoughts about, um, you know, this idea of following the creative thread and working in a judgment-free zone to open up space for your best creative ideas. Um, what is that sounding like to people? And while I'm waiting for that, I want to go back to this question of um, how do you create when you know other people like your family and things like that maybe doesn't understand art or isn't into art or doesn't prefer your style of art um, and you can't create privately? Because this is such a great question. So um, I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is to maybe think a little bit creatively about, you know, Let's, let's just suspend judgment for a minute about whether or not for sure there's no private space for you to do it. Um, you know, is it possible that you're doing, for instance, like work in a journal instead of on Canvas, for example, for the moment, and that you really are just kind of setting some boundaries with your family? Like, you know what? I understand you all don't get what I'm doing, and that's totally fine. Um, but this is important to me. It's kind of like going to the gym. It's my self care. I really need it. And I need it to be kind of like something that, you know, if you don't have something positive to say, I just want you to say nothing. Um, and that's very supportive to me. If you can just say nothing and just support me in doing it. Um, but I, it doesn't feel good to me if you make comments, even if you just say cool, because it's not really what I'm looking for. So could you support me by giving me some space to do this, right? I think it's totally acceptable to try and set some boundaries around these things. And sometimes our family just needs some tutoring about what we need, right? Like this is important to me. This is my self-care. It's like when you go to the gym. It's like when you read. It's like when you go on a walk with your friend. This is what I need. And this is how I need you to support me in it. Um, or, you know, is there a closet you can turn into an art space? Right? Do you really, really, really need that second, you know, space? Is there, um, you know, some other creative space where you can go? But I think it's a lot about setting those boundaries too, um, you know, or just <laughs> being a little bit like, hey, I'm drawing, um, and you're not going to show it to anybody, right? And you create those space, that space for yourself, and you respect yourself by setting that boundary. Um, so not sure if that 100% applies for you, but just some thoughts to keep in mind about how to negotiate that. Um, and Linda says that about the 100 day product she needed to, to simplify. And I think it's totally a great part of your process to learn that you could have simplified, right? And um, so I, I think that's a, a great place to be. And you could always jump back in with a simplified version of what's going on because you know, it's still early in April, so I, I forget where they are, like day, whatever today is, day 15 or something. Um, you could absolutely jump in now with a simplified version if that feels good to you. You know, maybe you also need a buddy, right? Maybe you need more structure and support than just an online community that's doing a project with you, right? Maybe you need someone who's going to be accountable with you and you can be texting and saying, did you do yours yet today? And that kind of thing. Now we also had a question about how to kind of separate good, your good art from your bad art. And this goes back to what we were talking about before about opening up a space for um, everything in your art practice. And I would say, I think in the beginning, you don't need to know. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And that might feel a little frustrating, um, but I, I think that it's really in the, important to try to suspend judgment in the beginning because you kind of don't know what's good and what's not good for you, right? In terms of your art, because 
what I might think is terrible, somebody else could think is fantastic and might put in a museum even. And the stuff that I think is amazing, uh, that same person would say like, that's junk, we're not interested in that, right? And so it's all very personalized. So don't worry right now, because a lot in the beginning, it's about just establishing that practice of being present and enjoying the moment and enjoying the process of creating. Because when it when you distill it all down, that's really why we're doing it. Right, we're, we're doing it, yes, because there's pleasure in the product, but there's pleasure in the process too. And if you lose the pleasure in the process of just doing, acting, creating, using your hands, enjoying through the senses, then there's very little sense in doing it, honestly, because most of us are not making museum art. And that's not the point. Um, so for the moment, I wouldn't worry about curating your work. You can certainly make friends with other artists who you trust and who will be kind and good to your heart about your work and will speak together honestly and kindly about opinions. But I wouldn't take any one person's opinion totally to heart either. There are times that I make something that I think, like I said, is fantastic and other people don't like, but it's important to me. And so I like it and I hang on to it. And other times vice versa. Um, let me see. Oh, yes. And um, I wanted to just highlight one other comment from our folks who made comments here from Jody. She said, any art creation, no matter what standard, if created from your heart is worthy. Amen. If you create for yourself, you are probably doing it to feel better, feel creative, feel happy. If you're creating for someone else, a commission piece, exhibition, a theme, you embrace other people's needs, thoughts, and expectations. That's such a good point, right? Because then you're you're doing something, there's some generosity in what you're doing. You're co-creating in a sense. She says, you have to prepare to be critiqued in that space. Be strong and open-minded. To create something for someone or to display your heart creations in a public domain means you have grown the courage. You're ready. Embrace it. Be empowered by it. Love what you do. And if you're having a, quote, bad day, acknowledge it. Put it aside and a good day may see it. And a good day may see it in a new light and bring it to life. I think that means, like, in other words, you might see it differently another day. Pretty Bird says, maybe we should call our bad art a funny name like Bart and take ourselves <clears throat> lightly and find joy in the process. I love that, Pretty Bird. I like Bart and it made me think of fart <laughs> or barf. <laughs> I make plenty of barf and Bart. <laughs> Embrace your Bart. Um, yeah, so... Um, if there's any last questions in the last minute or two here, I'd love to answer them. Otherwise, I really appreciate everybody being here and having these chat <coughs> excuse me, chats together are so fun. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so I hope everybody has a super fun and creative and open process this week and I will be back next week at one o'clock and um, if there's a particular topic that you would like to see addressed please um, drop that into a discussion thread and I would love to get your your thoughts on what you'd like to see happen in the meantime if you're interested in learning more about my mindful intuitive process my new paper cutting class layers of light is a really um, detailed lead through that helps kind of bring you through step by step. And that's um, mindfulartstudio.com forward slash layers of light. I hope you all are having a great day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.